Hey, everybody. Welcome to Stronger Than You Think, a podcast by Youth Villages, and I'm your host, Sam Coates. In each episode, you'll hear a story of passion and resilience from an employee of Youth Villages, one of the top children's behavioral and mental health organizations in the country. Children with emotional and behavioral challenges and their families face unimaginably difficult circumstances. And it takes a committed, well-trained and supported person to show up for these children and youth every day to help them find their path to well-being. Join us to hear from individuals as those on the front lines of this work as they talk about their career journeys and how their own personal experiences fuel their passion making a difference every day. In 1986, Youth Villages was founded in the merger of two small residential campuses in Memphis, Tennessee. Today, the nonprofit organization is a national leader in children's mental and behavioral health care and an advocate for positive change in how we help children, families, and young people overcome challenges and go on to success. Last year, Youth Villages 3,600 staff members worked in 23 states and the District of Columbia, making a positive impact in more than 36,000 lives. They served on residential campuses in Tennessee and Georgia and in community-based programs, particularly the Youth Village's nationally acclaimed models, Intercept and LifeSet. Pat, great to see you. Good seeing you, Sam. I didn't know we'd get around two on this. Yeah. Been looking la- forward to it. Last time it was, uh, I think, uh, over the phone. Yes, sir. Going back 1986, when Youth Village started, mm-hmm. and 40 children were impacted that year. Last year, 36,000 and 3,600 staff, men and women around the country. What do you think about or what are you most proud of for the 3,600 people that are engaged with, in doing this work with you? First off, I'm proud of all of them for just doing the work. But look, the last two and a half years have been very, very difficult years. I mean, uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, our world turned upside down, and not just personally, but professionally. And when you're in the business for caring for other people or helping other people kind of get through difficult times in their lives, it made our lives much more uh, difficult as well. Not only were you having to take care of yourself and your family, but you were taking risk of getting sick, coming to work every day if you worked in a residential program or, or going out and visiting a family in the community-based programs. And, and we didn't have staff that's, that said, you know, I don't want to come to work. Staff said, you know, what do I need to do? And, and they put uh, our kids and our families, in many cases, uh, ahead of their own. Is there a particular story of somebody specific that comes to mind? We're all essential. But the, the day that, uh, you know, we learned of the pandemic, the most essential staff were the staff that went into work every day in our register programs um, because they couldn't work from home. They couldn't call in. You know, <laughs> they can't do a, a remote Teams call or Zoom call. They've got to be right there with the kids every day. And uh, what, what I was so amazed with, and in, in the first six, eight months, I visited the campuses every day. I, you know, I wasn't traveling anymore. I wasn't going to meetings around the organization anymore, so I just hung out a lot of time on the campuses to spend time with staff and kids. And uh, we had fewer people calling in sick or calling out for some, you know, variety of reasons that staff may call out. Uh, they came to work. We had staff, if uh, they wanted to stay in a hotel for a period of time, if kids were, you know, in a safe area where they were wearing PPEs and the kids were kind of quarantined because somebody had COVID, that uh, they would stay in hotels away from their families to keep their family safe and come to work. I mean, I just, uh, you know, over and over, you know, met staff that shared their stories or showed their personal commitment. Was that the toughest season from a career standpoint for you? By far. I mean, you know, or the early days were tough because, you know, we always worried about we're going to have money to make the payroll or pay the bills. But we also, in the early days, you know, we were still trying to figure out the best way to take care of kids <laughs> at the same time. So, you know, those were challenging days just from a survival standpoint. But we had 25 kids, you know, in the early days and a handful, you know, 9, 10 staff. Now we have more than 1,000 staff working in those residential programs that we had to take care of every day. And I remember meeting with the staff uh, the first few days and and talking about it. I said, guys, you know, we were built for this, you know, that we've trained our lives for this. And um, 
and we have the right culture and the right level of commitment from the people working this organization to get through this. But uh, it's going to be all hands on deck, and everybody stepped up. N you know, nobody. You know, you really find the true character of a leader during a crisis. And we didn't have people that said, "Well, I'm just not coming to work," or "I can't do this." Uh, people gave a lot during that period, and still are. But um, yeah, it was it was a difficult time. But you know, actually, there was more. It's kind of weird, almost. There was more enthusiasm and excitement during those early months than you would expect. Remember, the kids couldn't go off campus. The kids couldn't visit their families. The families couldn't come and visit their children. You know, DCS workers or state workers, wherever a child was placed from, couldn't come visit them. It was just the staff that worked in that building every day. Our mentoring staff couldn't come visit their, their young person anymore that they served as a mentor for. There were, there were no more visitors or tours. It was just, just our staff and the kids. And our staff, they tried to make it, you know, as fun for the kids as possible because, you know, we, we were trying to understand what was going on. At the same time, we're trying to educate the young people what was going on. There's a woman that I was with on Monday, and she's from Texas. She's lived in seven or eight states. She's here in Memphis with Heath Villages now and Memphis Allies. And I did not set her up for this. This just came out of her in a very sincere way. But she says, one of the things that's different about Youth Villages is our CEO is a frontline leader. He's not a corner office person. And then that came up in another interview. A woman I was with this morning, Maggie, she talked about her own journey and her own story and what she's overcome herself. But she talked about one of the things that she loves about Youth Villages now is that it's not just nine to five. And she has the freedom in the day to take care of herself, but she knows the needs and the calls happen after. How have you been able to get that heartbeat and that urgency and that commitment all the way down to 3,600 men and women to where when a crisis does happen, people go even further all in to take care of the child and the family versus trying to just not adapt? You know, I think the great majority of the people we hire, uh, you know, have something unique in them already. <laughs> before they come to work at youth villages that, um, you know, says that I'm going to do whatever it takes. I know this is not going to be an easy job. This is not going to be a, a, a nine to five job. This is going to be an emotionally stressful job. You can't listen to other people's problems all day or face, you know, difficult circumstances and working in a residential program or even when you go into a family's home and, and just turn it off at, when you leave that day. Regardless of what time you leave, it stays in your head. I, I think that the people that really come here and stay for any length of time have something very unique that says, I care about other people. I'm willing to make some personal sacrifices from my, in my own life to help this young man or young woman or family get through this difficult stage in their life. But I also think that when you build a culture around people, I think people often respond to uh, how other people work. They sense the, the feel and the heartbeat of the organization after a period of time. Uh, this is the way that, that as an organization, we've, um, I don't know, kind of created an atmosphere of, of caring and commitment through all our people. And, and they see that uh, early on when they're here. And, and I love being out with the kids. I love being out with the staff. I mean, I, get, I don't like being in the office. Matter of fact, I don't ever, I've never learned anything sitting in my office. I learn a lot about <laughs> the organization going out and spending time on the campuses or being in training with the Memphis Allies staff or going out occasionally, you know, visiting a family in our community based work or seeing kids that, you know, have, have been here in, in our life set program or our scholarship program. And that's where you really get to know what's going on. I mean, I have direct reports and they tell me what, you know, that, that they need to tell me and I want to hear, but, but I, I never just, you know, make, decisions or, or or get a feel from the organization by the people that report to me or even uh, many of the leadership staff throughout the organization. I really get a feel for the organization, you know, talking to the frontline staff, sitting in training, hearing their concerns, uh, talking to the kids, those kind of things. I was with someone earlier, and they talked about when they applied, there's other processes that are done by different organizations where, you know, there's not as much personal interaction from the start. And she said one of the things that stuck out to her is they try, Youth Villages, regardless of the fast growth and the opportunity and the recognition and the strong partnerships and the need, they try to really understand the person each time that's coming into Youth Villages to make sure it's the right person. You just referenced there's something unique 
about each person here at Youth Villages that makes what you just said happen. What would happen if Youth Villages almost didn't make it more challenging on itself by being selective with the people that it brings in to where you would want people to be unique the way that you said it? We're, we're employing people to take care of children, okay? Okay. And, and some organizations may look at the kids they serve as other people's children. We look at our kids as if they were our own children. And our staff want to get to know people because getting to know someone, really, you have a better understanding of how they're going to take care of a young person or, or handle a, a certain circumstance. And, you know, the way it is, I mean, our, our history and how we grew up and how we were raised and how we were educated and what kind of drives us is very important. I mean, it's, you know, we're not, you know, shipping packages or, or you know, building cars or, you know, or, you know, working retail. I mean, we're, we're, we're taking care of people. And we, we want to know that these people are the right people. You know, we, you know, we want to know that these people that we're interviewing, getting to know, are going to respond in the best way when, 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 they're start, when they face the challenges they're going to face in working with a, a, a young person or a family with, with unique problems and, and challenges. And, and so, you know, you want to get to know that person. And if you get to know them months later and, you, and, 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 and they, don't, they don't have the character uh, and the, uh, maybe the, um, just the passion for this work, that's a problem. Uh, because, you know, our kids have had enough people coming out of their lives, you know, that, and giving them false hope. They need people that they can count on. They need people they can trust. They need people that they know they're going to be there tomorrow. If they're supposed to come to work, they're going to come to work tomorrow. They know if that person said they're going to help them, I don't know, with a, a school project or an art project or just sit and listen to them, that, that, that they're going to be available for them. And so you've got to have people that deeply care about other people, but they're also willing to, to share a little of themselves. You know, this is not a job you just— you walk in like a robot. You've got to walk in and be who you are uh, because uh, all of us, I mean, uh, are a reflection of who raised us and who we are with every day, uh, especially during our youth. And so we want these young people to have good experiences with wonderful people that care about them deeply, that are willing to share a little about, about themselves, maybe not too much sometimes, but enough for that young person gets an idea of who they are because, you know, we want all of our staff to be an example and a reflection of what this young person may be themselves one day. And not necessarily working in villages, but having a person that's caring, that's listening, that's giving, that's supportive, that's available, that's reliable, that's dependable. You want, you know, you want to represent those characteristics of yourself so these young people uh, can see that and hopefully model that one day. Several people that I've spoken with have talked about the abundance of internal opportunities that happen once you get here. Mm. Does that sound fair to you? Yeah, it's, it's very fair. Why are you an advocate of promoting from within? Well, I, I think that, one, I think you maintain the culture from promoting from within, okay? Also, you know, when you're in a position of leadership in this organization, you would have a very difficult time getting respect unless you had, had done the job uh, of the people you're leading. You really would. And it, on occasionally, we hire someone from outside the organization. It's very, very rare. But, you know, we want, you know, we have a lot of processes and systems and, and, and ways of just doing things that it'd be, it's much easier for a leader that grew up here to have learned all those methods and processes and systems and safety plans and just what's built in our culture of the organization uh, to grow up through the organization versus coming from outside. To learn that stuff as a leader from outside, it's tough. It's, it's really tough. And also, you know, leaders have a lot of responsibility. And we want to make sure we've got the right people in positions of leadership because they're not just responsible for young people. They're responsible for the people taking care of the young people or working in the community-based programs. So you want them to have a, a, an extra level of, of uh, expertise and, and not necessarily commitment but willingness to, to go far beyond because, look, a lot of people think it's, oh, it's great, I want to be a supervisor, but, you know, working with staff uh, that, are, that are new and working with young people can be a challenge as well. Somebody else I was with today, they said that one of the things that's helped them at their life from a career standpoint is pay to where in the industry it's low as a whole or from a reputational standpoint. 
but they said it's it's meaningful to them from a family standpoint to where they don't have to worry about money. I mean, they're not getting rich, right. but they're they're getting they're getting taken care of well. And I know Youth Village has, has you know received a lot of praise publicly, a lot of strong partnerships, donors, et cetera. But is there anything that you could speak to for the next five, ten, fifteen years and beyond on how you want people that are here to be taken care of financially? And is that really a benefit, a true benefit to help them do their jobs better? You know, um, this field we're in across the board doesn't pay very well. And one thing that we don't do, we don't say, well, what are other people in our field paying? We want to pay, you know, comparable to what they're paying. Or we want to pay in the mid-range of what they're paying. And often you hear that from, from, from leaders and organization. And our leadership team, our board of directors are constantly uh, looking for ways to compensate our staff at a higher level. Uh, I would love for our staff to be able to have enough money to take their kids to the movie, you know, take a vacation every year. You know, if there's a financial crisis in their family, uh, they have some, some additional resources to help, you know, address that and not go broke by borrowing money or, or going to friends and relatives, you know, just to, to survive. You know, this is very, very hard work. And, and like I said, we're, we're making progress, but we, um, we've still got a lot of work to do. Curious about people that have believed in Youth Villages, believed in you from the early days and the impact of from supporters that are, you know, not here nine to five, but that Youth Villages has a special place in their heart from their time and from a resource standpoint. And earlier this week, somebody I was with, they talked about how, again, you were walking with a child. They talked about when it rained, they had no place to go. Mm -hmm. And then Youth Villages builds this beautiful facility. And it was just quick feedback loops. But I assume to make something happen like that fast, Youth Village just has to be in a strong position financially and also has to have strong donors. Is that fair? That's fair. How have donors and partners throughout your entire career helped accelerate the heart and the drive of the people that you've talked about and also your your own heart over these last several decades? You know, in the early years, we didn't really have any money. And um, it, was, it was a real problem. But... Um, we learned in the early years that if, if you create the right plan and if you create a strategy around what the needs of the organization are, that'll favorably impact the future of a young person or, or a family as well. And if you build this plan in a way that's very clear, and so a person that has resources or a foundation that has, has you know financial resources, and you present that plan to them and, and they trust that you're going to use the money uh, exactly according to your plan and that the chances of success are, are very, very high, people will support you, people will fund you. And fortunately, we've met a lot of people over the years that care about young people and they care about youth villages and that they care about the future of this organization. They've been very, very generous. You know, we, we have been very, very fortunate to have the kind of resources we have today. But we didn't have those years ago and I remember the sleepless nights. Uh, I worry, I still have sleepless nights, but. I don't worry about the financial future of the organization like I used to or making the payroll. You know, even, you know, as I say, every every big thing Youth Villages has ever done, and I'll, and I'll say intercept, life set and out Memphis allies, it starts with a blank sheet of paper and without any money in your wallet. I mean, there's no money and there's just an idea. And, uh, and we've been able to uh, create tremendous resources from the private sector as well as government for life set, uh, for intercept, and, and hopefully soon uh, even more from Memphis Allies. It's the same way with the capital campaign. I mean, uh, every time before we start building a building, you know, we ask ourselves, you know, where's that money gonna come from? And really, and over the years I've said, look, let's not worry about the money. Let's, let's design the building the way we think it's, it's best to serve our young people, uh, the best place for our staff to work. It's safe. You know, it, it's fun, it's, it's light-filled, um, you know, it, 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 it'll meet the special needs of many of the young people that are in our register programs, and we'll worry about the money along the way. But during those periods where we're creating design for a building or we're building a new program like Memphis Allies or Life Center Intercept, we're engaging uh, the private sector and the government sector during that period. We want them to be part of the, uh, the planning process. We want them to be part of uh, you know, better understanding what their needs are as well, because a lot of these government agencies, they have particular needs. I remember when we built Bill's Place, you know, we were asking, well, who are the kids we wanted to serve? And I said, well, 
we talked for days. I said, why don't we do, why don't we go back and look at the last couple of years of all the kids that were referred to us and we couldn't take, we turned them down. Let's go and look at what were the characteristics of those young people and let's build a facility to take care of those kids. And that's pretty much the kind of kids are in Bill's place today are kids that, for the most part, we didn't accept four, five, six years ago because we didn't really have the, the facility and the right program to meet their needs. Where'd you get that sense of principle to where you can think about the kid only first, have your complete focus on them, and then think about the money later to where you don't waver, you don't yeah. justify what yeah. the child needs or what the family needs, and you start there, mm-hmm. and then you trust the rest will follow? You know, if, if you start with money, you're going to limit yourself, okay? You're going you're gonna to limit yourself, and you're going to limit the organization, and you're going to, I will say, in every time we start with money, it was a very low number that wouldn't achieve very much, okay? And when we first started, we were caring for tens and twenties and thirties and forty numbers of kids, okay? And we didn't have any money, so we had to be very cautious of every penny we spent. We had to limit ourselves in conversations. But as we've grown so much over the years, I've, I've asked the staff, you know, take those barriers, take them off the table. Don't even think about the money right now. Think about what the needs are now. We're going to get crazy. We're not going to add marble. We're not going to, you know, do something ridiculous, you know, in, in, in designing a building in terms of costs. But we are going to think big uh, because the needs are big. And uh, I also think that if you have a, the right plan and, and it's, it's, a, it's a big plan, it'll have a big impact. I think uh, a lot of your donors with more resources and foundations get excited about that. Because cause I, I hear often that, you know, a lot of times people bring small ideas, you know, to donors. And just look at Memphis Allies. I mean, just think about Memphis Allies. Okay, we've got a city that is extremely violent. I mean, you can't get away from the information that's shared. It, it, there's no way, unless you live in a, in a cave in the woods, that, that you don't know what's going on in our city. And so many people say, you know, but the problem is so big. I said, that we've got to create a big plan to resolve, to help uh, reduce the level of murders and crime in our city and violence. So, so it is a big plan, but, you know, you're not going to have an impact on a city of 650,000 people if, if you go out and raise, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars want to serve 20 guys. That's just not going to work. And so we said, we're going to build the plan to serve every high-risk person we could identify in this city. And, and that's, that's what we did. And then you're saying supporters... They're sad about the problem. They're hurt by the problem, but they get energy about somebody that has optimism and a plan and a track record of creating positive change and creating positive impact. And so what you're saying is that speaks to the community, that speaks to supporters, because then they want to take what they have and they want to put that into something where they feel like people are locked in to make a difference. Is that the kind of buzz, the energy that you've seen? That's kind of it. You know, we're really just just getting into Memphis Allies. We really... We have not really uh, approached the community in a big way asking for financial support. We, 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 you know, we, we have somewhat in the early, in, in the first phase, but we are just now going to be going to everyone in this city and asking for help. I'm talking about large business owners, small business owners, philanthropists, foundations, city, county government. But this, this is new to us, too. This is something that we haven't done before. We have not worked with the most violent people in the community. We have not worked with adults committing gun violence in a community. And there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of successful programs around the country that we can say that we're using exactly that model to help address this problem. Now, we are using some consultants that have had some success uh, in different parts of the country, but um, I'm confident that once we share our plan, once we start having success, and I believe we're already having some success in the Fraser area, that um, we'll, we'll receive all the necessary support we need. Let's say there's a man or woman out there listening that might be getting out of their undergrad or might be getting their master's mm-hmm. or might even be in their 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s, like some of the people I've spoken with, that has a heartbeat with the way that you've described it, has a heart for this work, has a heart for impact. Based off where Youth Village is now and what you see for the future, why is this a place that they should consider to come in and do this work and receive the things that we've talked through up to this point? First of all, I think we have, a, we have a very good culture. We have a strong culture of people that work here. I believe they'll find a family atmosphere. I believe they'll find a, a nurturing environment 
for them while they're nurturing and caring for our young people. I think they'll find tremendous career opportunities if they want to stay in this field. Uh, but even if they want to just, you know, we've had a lot of young people come here for just a year or two and move on to another career. That's great. That's great. But the, the one thing I learned when I, when I started this, it's been more than 49 years ago when I started in this work, is you also learn a lot more about yourself than you ever thought you would. Because these young people and these families, they will challenge you. The circumstances that they are facing, the level of, uh, of mental health problems, the level of uh, just overwhelming circumstances that have just consumed their lives, it presents you a real challenge to help sort through all that and help create the best plan, the best way to intervene, the best way to listen and talk to a young person or, or work with a family. I mean, you are tested to the limit. And I will tell you, I don't think there's a job more challenging on earth than helping a troubled child or a troubled family advance to a life of, of happiness, to a life of uh, being responsible for themselves, a life that you know, doesn't require you to be put in an institution or a psychiatric facility or, or a jail or, or having social workers or counselors just consume your life forever or be in debt and have health problems and mental health problems and, and all the circumstances so many of our kids you know, have now in their lives. I mean, it is a real, I mean, it, it, is, it is a giant puzzle with a lot of moving parts and overwhelming circumstances that you've got to help sort through. And so if, if somebody wants a real challenge, a personal challenge and a professional challenge, this is the place to come to work. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be given a tremendous amount of training. Uh, they'll be given tremendous opportunity for advancement. They'll be giving, like I said, the necessary nurturing and support to help the young people and the families. And like I said, if, if they don't want to stay in this field a long time, I mean, I meet people all the time that, that said, oh, I worked there, you know, 20 years ago. I had the great, here's what I learned. And they'll talk about what they learned 20 years ago in their life today. But here's something else too, especially for young people. You're gonna probably have some kids one day. And I'm gonna tell you, this is great training ground for a parent uh, because you're gonna, you're gonna know how to work with your kids. <laughs> and you're gonna be a much more confident parent, but not just a more confident parent, you're gonna be a much more confident person after uh, some time working at Youth Villages because you'll know that I, I joke and often say that, you know, you work at Youth Villages, especially in the early years as a front line, it's like a boot camp. You know, you get to know yourself. You get to know how to work with the team. Uh, you get to know how to overcome some rough days with a group of children or a young person or a family. We were supposed to meet for the first time maybe end of July. And then I got an email Friday before saying that actually you had family in town. Your kids might have been in town. Right. And so need to be rescheduled. Yeah. You know, I've heard men and women up to this point talk about how they've had to take care of themselves personally. And any experience I've had with any entrepreneur or any CEO, their schedules are very full. Mm -hmm. The work can be very taxing on themselves personally. You've also talked about you learn to be resilient here and you learn things about yourself. Is there anything that you can share about you personally, how you've seen your own life be shaped mm -hmm. and improved and benefited from through this career that you've had, not just the other people I've spoken with. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I mean, the people that I work with here, and especially the ones that I've worked with closely over the years, I mean, they are, there's, they're like a family. I mean, these people are very, very important in my life. You know, when you're, when you're dealing with problems all hours of night and day, I mean, you're dealing with other people's family as well. I mean, you know, you know, it's, this, this work never stops. I mean, it, it, net today we're serving 8,203 young people and families across the country. And someone's responsible for what happens with those young people and those families. Uh, someone's directly responsible and held accountable for those people to work their plan and, and help, help them achieve their goals. And so I get great rewards, you know, seeing the success of our kids as well as our staff. And, uh, you know, Personally, you know, my personal life is entwined completely with this organization. I mean, and my my family has always been very, very supportive. But there had there's been there, there there's been times <laughs> when dad's been gone too much, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 husband hadn't been around enough. But you know, I, I guess we all learn from that and move on. Yeah, but I, mean, I guess my point is, you sound human too, <laughs> yeah. and it sounds that 
it's shaping you just like the way that I've heard it from others. Is that fair? Sure. Sure. I mean, not a lot of people, you know, just put off meetings. I mean, people put off meetings, but it just, there was a message there about family. Well, and I thought it was unique. Yeah. You know, I'm probably better now at putting my kids and, and grandkids uh, first. In the old days, you know, when I was here years ago, there was just like a handful of nine or 10 staff. So, you know, uh, if one or two are out, it's a real problem. Well, we've got a lot of folks here now. I mean, right. if I'm out for a day or uh, I want to spend time with my family who's visiting in town, you know, there's a lot of people that can take care of things. They don't need me right. <laughs> around necessarily like it used to be. Well, I just, I didn't come at it from a yeah. critical standpoint. It was humanizing. It was almost an encouragement. Mm. Youth Village's Intercept program recently had a very strong rating and received a very strong recognition. Is that true? That's true. Hey, everybody. One thing real quick, where we're at in the conversation, I want to remind you what Intercept is. Intercept is a nationally recognized, evidence-based, comprehensive in-home services model that meets children and families at a critical crossroads and helps them find their way to well-being. It keeps families together and has been found to reduce child welfare placement and speed permanency. Thanks so much. Let's get back to the show. What was that exactly? It was called Well Supported on the Clearinghouse for really an act called Family First, which really, you know, when we started Intercept, just go back a little bit, we started, actually, we started our community-based programs back in the early 90s and mid-90s, and we, and Intercept evolved out of us working in the community with families that we built this unique program uh, for young people and families called Intercept. And uh, for the first two years, I mean, Nobody really wanted to fund in-home services. And actually, uh, even when we started getting a little funding, it was a very small amount of funding. And one of the greatest challenges always with, with, with government is where's the money going to come from? Well, state government is always much more willing to, to support a program or initiative if they can draw down some level of federal funding for that program. And uh, until just a, a few years ago, there was no real way – that states could draw down large amounts of federal money to support community-based services. It's, it might sound crazy, but if a kid was put in a foster home or residential treatment program, they could draw down federal funds. But there really wasn't a pathway from the federal government to, to send money to states for community-based services, which is all the science, all the our experiences say the best way to work with a young person and family is first in the community. You want to do everything possible to keep them in the community with their family versus removing them and by court and putting them in foster care or state custody. And so this um, bill was passed several years ago. But in order for a state to draw down the most amount of money, uh, they could only draw that money for programs that were considered well-supported. And you have to go through a, a tremendous amount of, of research you know, to be able to be scored as well supported. There has to be clinical trials, quasi-experimental design studies. There has to be, a, uh, it takes a, a lot of work for a model to be approved to be well supported. It, it, it's, it's reviewed by a lot of the, the best research scientists in America, and there's a lot of criteria that you have to uh, meet to be able to approve at that level. And, uh, and we were approved uh, about oh about eight or nine months ago, and so that allows states now. The biggest barrier for us to expand our intercept program across the country has been the states don't have the financial resource to do it or not do it very big. And now there's a tremendous amount of money at the federal government. As a matter of fact, the lowest amount a state can receive now is fifty percent. I mean, state because it can receive even more than fifty percent of the federal government, depending on what state it is and what their scores are in terms of how they're funded. Uh, so it's a tremendous, it, 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 uh, it opens up a floodgate of opportunity for states, not just the money, obviously, to, but to serve young people and families in the best way um, that is made very clear through evidence and science and data that, it's, uh, that the Intercept program is a very effective model. So what you're saying now, because of this award or because of this recognition that Intercept now has, states now get federal funding that can pass through to help continue the expansion. That's right. And so what you're saying is this creates a lot of opportunity for men and women around the country that want to do this work to serve in this way. Tremendous opportunity. I mean, yes. I mean, uh, we could see an explosion of growth with our Intercept program. And the only thing would limit it, I think, right now is really 
fighting staff. Yeah, I mean, I really, I, I see we, we are already talking to, you know, more than a dozen jurisdictions now about, about uh, expanding our intercept program. And the only limit would be uh, have, having staff to really implement the model. What's the aspect of resiliency within youth villages to continue to do the work that matters, to do it the right way, to do it with the restrictions, to do it, you know, when the system itself is set up a certain way, but to keep being the proof of that mm-hmm. change, regardless of funding, regardless of recognition. I mean, how would you describe that with the people here and with yourself that you've been able to persevere and continue to do that for decades, well before any recognition happened? Well, we don't really think about recognition. We think about, you know, the outcomes of young people and, and how they're going to, you know, perform after they complete our program or their family. That's what we really focus all of our attention on. And, um, I think we're a learning organization, okay? We are constantly tweaking our models and tweaking our programs and adding a new intervention or learning a better way for a staff to intervene with a young person or a family or uh, learning a better way uh, to train a staff person or to train a person in leadership position. And, and, and I believe our staff know that we value their, their feedback and their input. You know, I don't ever want us to be an organization that's so big it takes forever to shift or to change, and I'm sure it feels that way sometimes, but we really try to move quickly when we see an opportunity to do something better to enhance the outcomes of our young people and improve the work environment of our staff. Um, I just think that, you know, nobody wants to come into a job and say, okay, this is how we do it, A, B, C, and D. You know, they want to come into a job and say they understand there are certain things you have to do. We have contracts with the government. There's a lot of rules and regulations and lawyers involved in everything we do, but there's still a, quite a bit of flexibility on, on how we go about our day-to-day work. So I, I just think, I think people like to, to be involved. I think they, they want some degree of flexibility, understanding there's, you know, there's government rules and regulations that have to be followed. But, um, you know, every industry has that. <laughs> it's not just our industry. It doesn't matter where you work, you're going to have certain rules and regulations and processes and systems that you just have to follow. So what you're saying is, if I'm hearing you correctly, you have a lot of partners, you work with a lot of states, there's a lot of processes and procedures that need to be done. But at the same time, data has been instrumental to youth villages. Data measures the impact to each child and each family. And you want to be a place that is exciting. It's fast moving. Feedback loops are fast. You're always tweaking it because you're never trying to settle. Right. Even Monday, I heard from somebody that said, if you want to call the CEO and talk about a child, you can call the CEO and talk about a child. And she just said, that's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. So I guess what you're saying here is you want to respect the system and do the work the way it needs to be done with the partnerships, but you also, you just never want to limit the progress. No, just, just, I'll give you a perfect example. Right now, uh, we had three young people in our intercept program, heavily involved in juvenile justice issues, and we had just started working with these three young people. And uh, these three young people had some problems. And um, I asked the staff, I said, I'd like to read all their, I'd like to read all three of these 